Thank you, Matty, but with these last comments, I can already skip one third of my presentation. <laughs> uh, yeah, actually, um, yesterday also on the boat, when chatting with the people, um, I heard sometimes comments about, yeah, no, no, we don't know if you would like to ask for an authorization or think it twice over if you stop activities. Well, to be honest and frank, uh, I would say if you go for an application for authorization, think it really true, okay? And I assume when you go for it, your decision is I want to continue the business in the EU. What you do outside is not covered by that, of course. I want, and I think that's an important one, um, minimize the uncertainty on the market because if you're Annex 14, certainly uh, companies have experienced lots of uncertainty and that's expressed in many things, even in increases of insurance premiums, for example. Mm -hmm. And lastly, um, I assume that once you want to submit, you want to go for the case that is successful. Um, and surprisingly, we must say that sometimes we saw authorizations who forgot that last part when we saw the quality and the content of those. So these are the real, real, real core decisions to be taken for you, okay? So let's go very quickly about experience. Um, and experience in two areas, namely uh, joint versus individual and what and how were choices made in companies. And uh, secondly, uh, I would also like to share some experience about downstream users versus upstream, the last point uh, which was made by uh, Matty. And I'm going to look over a couple of issues as you see there. But let's take two steps back. This is a table that was established by Eka, and I loved it, where they brought actually all the things a bit together. Um, what were the substances, what was the scope of the authorizations, was it narrow, was it broad, under which road was it, uh, what was, was it a breaching uh, AFA or not, uh, what were the review years that RAC and SEA concluded on, and uh, were there additional conditions without specifying them. And they did that actually for all, and actually we should even update that after the uh, May-June meetings. Uh, but in general, if you look carefully to that table, you can actually draw some conclusions. And that's a real experience so far, no? We see that, uh, first of all, that there is clearly a move towards more DUs being involved. And surprisingly enough, uh, most of the people here are either consultants or manufacturers. <coughs> and not that many DUs, while we now see that the DUs are more and more submitting. Secondly, uh, we also see that uh, the more focused an AFA was, so the narrow or very narrow as it is described there, usually the larger review period is. Could be a quality issue, could be just an issue of specification. We go a bit more in detail later. Um, we also see, if we take that timing or review period into account, that it looks like that joint applications are feasible, for sure, but they are a bit more challenging, and we will see that. And we heard that already yesterday from Tim, too. And lastly, uh, we clearly see in the last column on the conditions. Uh, they are often related to outstanding uncertainties in the applications. So there are some learning lessons to be drawn from the existing applications so far. Okay? Now, we heard from many speakers before, uh, authorization is a new territory. It's true, but let's be honest. Our experience now is pretty well, uh, and I think we certainly um, know and understand the basics from step A to Z. Now, so what are the challenges to deal with uh, from an experience based? First of all, and I cannot <laughs> enough underline that, is we have here talked now one day or one and a half day about all the ECA thing and all the thing you need to think about when you submit. But there's a lot before that. How do you organize in your company? I heard yesterday somebody saying, well, we have to talk between two units from a consultant. It's even difficult. Well, if you have to talk within a company between six units, it's more difficult. And very often, this, this task is giving to the environmental unit or the sustainability unit while it's a market decision. <laughs> uh, secondly, is if you're going to do about joint submissions, um, well, 
to how you're going to organize yourself, what legal structure are you going to use, how you're going to set up your legal rulings. This takes a lot of time, and we haven't talked about that at all here. And I must say, in some consortia, that took almost as much time as setting up the file. So don't underestimate that one. Okay, carefully assessing the appropriate application route didn't solve a big issue, to be honest and frankly. CI experience clearly was. Uh, it's improving now, but we very often saw, uh, if you look to the SEAS, that they were too broad, you know? They were not really narrowing down on the issue that made the difference, that really proved your case. Um, and that's really still a point of attention, but it's certainly improving. The same, actually, with the extent and the level of assessment of alternatives. I must say, when I was as an outsider reading some of those, I was wondering, is do applicants take this point serious, you know? <laughs> uh, do they believe that the public consultation will not submit those? So it is very relevant that you keep your attention on the assessment of alternatives because society is certainly also improving on that one. And you heard from the MITS that that's the best way to keep uh, the public consultation under control. And another experience we had is that very often we were maybe a bit too focused on the hazard endpoint you were concerned about, let's say reprotox. Uh, and we did everything to prove and to compare on the reprotox, and then we forgot maybe that some of the substitutes were sensitizers. Okay? So keep that a little bit broader. Don't be too narrow there. Fine? So let's now go over some of those um, in a quicker mode. If you prepare for an application, uh, companies, they usually make uh, three decisions, of course, uh, which application wrote, uh, which use application do I want to submit for, and can I do it commonly? And what I will try to do is uh, not only look this from the manufacturers, but particularly from the downstream users. And it's important because, as you saw, two-thirds so far of the applications were submitted by downstream users. And also see if we can here uh, recommend joint or individual authorization applications or what the learnings are there. Okay. If you're a manufacturer, you know exactly what questions you have to fulfill now if you go out here. You heard extensively the readiness uh, or, or are my alternatives readily available? Do they have the same functionality? Or are they economically and technically feasible? That you all know. I added actually one you should really look for, and it's that last one. Are the alternatives you propose or you want to go for sustainable in the long-term future? Um, think about that one. That's not so, and that's also to your, the case you defend. If you're in a heavily declining market, you better think twice. Okay? Now, the answers on, your, on these questions will also determine if you can work together with colleagues and or competitors in the same market, namely, uh, if they're quite common or not. And as you know, um, there are four tools, and we heard yesterday that the new format is actually a bit merging the SEA with the assessment of alternative, but the safe use demonstration, the substitution planning, these are the four tools. And each of you will assess if they are relevant to your case, of course. Um, you will assess, I assume, if you can do them jointly, and you will assess uh, if you can do them or better do them individually. And um, that's usually how uh, we saw that consortia were, uh, I would say, attacking this, this question about will we work together with the colleagues. And we found out that they lost usually half a year only with this exercise, finding out do we have friends to submit or not, do we have a business case to do it jointly or not, and what structure do we need. Turn it around. Why don't you start for that exercise about the use perspective, not the company, okay? The use perspective. What users do me and my colleagues want to cover? And then try to find out what are the companies that are interested in it, and then trying to find out what their view is in general terms on the SEA, on the safe use demonstration, and on it. We have seen in one case that that's a much easier approach. And it's logic, because your application is intended for a use. 
it should be focused on the use from the first step. So set your consortia up and organize it along users and not so much along companies. And I know that's not so easy because you have to think quite differently than you usually do. Okay? Now there are a couple of things that can make a judgment about will I go jointly or will I go individually. Um, first of all, uh, I assume that factors that uh, benefit going jointly is that you have a common concern. I hope your DNL uh, reference and your CSR is equal, <laughs> otherwise you may have an issue in a consortium. Um, I hope you focus on common users, okay, and particularly, and so far they do, but then they forget and sometimes group companies or users that have completely different SEA drivers. If your SEA driver if your cost impact driver is very different between companies, for example, one does it on net profit, the other one does it on substitution cost and things like that, then you're up for misery, I would say, if you go jointly, okay? Alternatively, there are aspects that can help you determining to go individually. And in particularly, if you have a company-specific concern, like we just heard the case of Huntsman, we want to be sure, because we are a very big client, we want to ensure that we are in time ready. When you have a very different use than what is covered jointly, of course, don't try to get you in for so, quote, a cost reduction, because what uh, was one of the myths, the price to pay afterwards, if you get only four years instead of seven or 12, can be much higher. And, of course, if you want to use uh, to a great extent, company-specific data sets. In evidence, it's not so difficult, but really look it from the use, that's my main message, uh, from the learning cases. But in the end, um, you can choose what you want, to go jointly or individually. Uh, just be clear uh, and identify clearly where you work together, where you don't, and do it in a very structural way. Um, the experience also indicates, and particularly now looking to the Dancing users, that there is a higher tendency for joint applications uh, if at the DU level. And it's understandable because DUs, they usually group together around a specific use with a specific assessment of alternatives. That's not so illogic. We also see that if you organize joint uh, preparations, at least, at the manufacturer level, it's so complicated if you have to deal with too many or uh, too complex supply chains. The simpler the supply chain is very often, the more successful the joint application is. So um, that's clearly determining that balance between higher tendency or lower tendency for working together and lastly of course the amount of CBI to be covered but we heard from Erwin that that is decreasing. That's the logic where we all look to but alternatively um, I suggest before you make that decision that you also look to other aspects and some of them are not so obvious. For example can I work together with my competitors for business reasons? Can be a very valid question, isn't it? Uh, are they even accessible, to be honest and frankly? If this is an importer that comes from Kazakhstan and is just there to surf on you, you may have take a different decision. It's a business decision, I agree, but that's what it is all about. Um, if you want to do it at the level of the DUs, your access to the CSR, and I come back to that one, is not such clear always. Okay? So you may at that moment do something jointly with the manufacturer to get easier access to your CSR. And of course, who would submit and at what level, and I come back on that one. So don't focus only on these cases about the users. Organizational aspects are as relevant. Good. Joint versus individual. Um, if I'm a DU, if I'm a DU, data access is a challenge. Um, and this has all the consequences with it. I give you an example. The manufacturer did his hazard profile. Uh, in its hazard profile, it, it determined his DNL or his dose response. Uh, so he has all that knowledge. I have not as a DU. So if I want to do this as a DU, first I need access, and two, I need to understand it, if he did a good job. Now, we heard yesterday that, um, well, ECA does this job for you, if you wish, DNL, DML, I must say they do it a bit precautionary, 
that's my personal view sometimes um, alternatively if you want to challenge that you gonna need to be very strong in your scientific assessments alternatively it helps you as a as a downstream user a lot because it means that for the CSR part you don't actually need the hazard part you can use that reference and focus the CSR part to only the aspects that are relevant for your use and focus mainly on the exposure assessment which you have to do anyway so conclusively using the right values makes you much more independent from your manufacturers if as a DU you want to submit at that level oh that was the wrong way alternatively don't be too narrow as I said before on the selection of your uh, health endpoints because if you compare them in a comparison particularly for your substitution planning you better also are assured that there are not other hazards involved that in the end will come back to you okay the third issue is of course there are two roads as you know the adequate control road or the uh, uh, SARE road and does that have consequences about how I organize and joint an individual well not so much but there are issues to consider um, on the adequate control road it's clear that you better have a common view on the DNLs if here it isn't you better split from the start okay and you do it individually and you make your case for the SEA route, it's a bit the same, but then on the socioeconomics, um, you better have, if you want to work jointly together, a good view on your drivers that determine uh, the cost impact of your case or the cost benefits of your case. Um, and of course, in that case, certainly uh, an, a common view on the approach on how you would tackle the SEA and the assessment of alternative. With other words, it's a, it's a narrow balance you need to take into account. But from the experience, we notice that independent if it is adequate control or SEA road, you can jointly apply you, or you cannot. It rather determines to the point I said before. Good. Now, that's fine. But there is a philosophical difference between how manufacturers and users look to the future and the availability of the substance. And I hope the future is not the next exit as it is there on the picture. If you're a manufacturer, um, what you look for, of course, if you want to go for an application, um, is the substance future assured? With other words, do I notice the potential for a substitute? That's your investment to be done. And maybe the big question, may user substitute it and you hope that they tell you now if I was a smart user I would not tell my supplier if I have a substitute in mind and that risk is there of course uh, but they have also a question to the manufacturers they are not always clear if the manufacturer will still supply them in the long-term future he will get that signal when he sees that the manufacturer is applying of course so the views and particularly the planning between manufacturers and users can be very different and I think that's what we also saw in some of the cases where we saw two submission levels appearing. Of course you should try to clear that out as early as possible actually even at the level of the candidate list. The reason or even earlier at the RMOA and the reason for that is of course that will uh, drive the market decision to go for an application or to go for a search for substitution or not. Okay. Um, so we heard that in the end, uh, defining the level of on where I would submit uh, looks easy, but it isn't. And there are many more decisions to be taken than just the money for the file. It's the knowledge also, but it's also business decisions. I explain it here. The general feeling is, uh, well, if I do it at the user level, it's, or, sorry, if I do it at the manufacturer's level, top down as we call it, it's cheaper. If I do it at the downstream user level, it's easier. And honestly, in general, maybe it is. I think these two paradigms are right. But there are consequences, as you heard about it. And the consequences I try to summarize here a bit, and these are just the only one we have noticed happening. There may be others, okay? If you do the top-down approach, which is level one, it's not legally required, as you know, but it's how the rich text was philosophically written. 
But it's really, uh, you really need a clear uh, supply chain. Because if the supply chain is complex, you easily will lose the particularities of your users, or some of the users will just drop off. They will be outside the scope you defined in your uh, broad, in your BU. So the level one has some consequences for DUs that are not covered. And very often they find that out in the end. Uh, it's not the first one, first manufacturer's consortium that trims its applications in scope at the end. And finding as a downstream user out when it is 10 to 12 that you're out of scope, it's painful. But uh, this happened. So you could say, fine, let's then go to level three. Uh, let's do it pu uh, purely at the end user level. Okay? And then, uh, yeah, you can do that, of course, and there's many benefits. You can make a lean, focused, clearly uh, described uh, application. But as you know, such an application goes only one step up. And if there is then a formulator, and above that, a manufacturer or importer, that may not be enough. So yes, there will be cases where a level two at a formulator level, uh, the submission should be uh, submitted. We have such cases, but not a lot. Um, and that is required if the supply chain is more than two steps, let's say three steps. In that case, you will have, if it is not a top-down. Um, but besides that, there are a couple of real business considerations to be made, okay? This division in three levels seems obvious. But if you are a downstream user and you are linked with your supplier in Europe, but you also import from outside Europe the formulated substance, you will need an application at your level. With other words, if you want to be free about where you sample your material from in an open market, you may consider to do a double authorization for your own, despite your cover upstream. And people say, yeah, okay, that has a cost. Well, the cost of supply may be much larger <laughs> if you look at over 7 or 10 or 12 years. Uh, think about that one. Uh, these are costs which are usually uh, many zeros, huh, if I may call it this way. Okay, so lastly, in the end, do we have experience about how much time you need to prepare those things? Yeah, we have, of course. Uh, in general, while there are cases that did it in three weeks, uh, I would really not recommend you to do so. Really not. Um, it's going to be rather a headache dossier then. But in general, if you want to plan it carefully, it's a strategic vision, business discussion. You don't gamble, okay? And you're preparing, you take your time. Six to 12 months at the DU level for the case itself is really what you need, okay? And then you can make a case with integrated impact from the business people, the research people, and others. If it's shorter, the attention to the assessment of alternative usually makes a deep dive. If you do it upstream, and I now mean at the manufacturer level, in general, it's one year. Why is it a bit more? Because it's very often difficult to contact the use and finding out what the exposure profiles are, how they use it in practice, so to improve your CSR or exposure conditions, of course. That's what I call the naked timing, okay? Put on that the equipment, okay? And I mean there, uh, it's the time you need to set up the consortium. It's a time to arrange your uh, decisions. Do I go jointly or do I go individually? And how do I come to an agreement with my partners? In some cases, that took a year. So if that's the case, and you put there a year on that year there, you're easily on two years and more. If it is a very complex one, you add another year, three years. Now, your LAD may be 18 months, huh? So if you start organizing your consortia at the moment, you see Annex 14, slick, slick, click, it may be a red light for you. Okay? So my real message is here, if you're on a complex supply chain, you want to do it jointly, take the decision up front, like for example the Chromates people did, and really organize all the things up front. Okay? And what about the review period? We heard that very often this was taken at the end by consortia. I think now it's much better understood. Um, of course, either you go for a bridging period and then it's 
pretty define what you ask for, or you go for uh, the normal application where, let's be honest, as industry, we want it as long as possible in general terms. Okay? But the key of success is not as you think in the committees. The key of success for that is with you. I think Tim made it yesterday very clear. It's not only the risk related to your case you prove, but it's also all the uncertainties around. And that's the same for the SEA, for the assessment of alternatives. So the more, and I don't mean volume, but the more precise you are on your dosage on each of those factors, the better and the more robust your case is. It's a bit like going to a bank asking for a big draw, okay, and just don't have any guarantee. I think the price you're going to pay is going to be high. If you do that with a very good uh, guarantee and a very good case, the interest rate is going to be much lower. That's exactly what it is here about. But turn the, the interest rate to the reciproc of the timing. Okay? Fine, so what are the conclusions? An authorization application, the experience is, bu is building and it's not a gambling case. Under the condition, uh, you do early preparation before the Annex 14 is published. I think you heard that clearly. Uh, the collaboration between applicants is absolutely feasible, but you need to be very carefully think that through. And you may even think to submit at several levels, at the level of the consortium and individually, if you have a business driver for that. Okay? And don't forget that one. And the quality, let's say it's the quality of your dossier, will to a large extent influence uh, the timing. And lastly, as you see that with that orange there, expect the unexpected. Okay? That always appears. And don't forget, um, and I said that several times, an application is like firing a rocket. Huh? Um, I hope you're not Apollo 13, it was, who say, Houston, we have a problem halfway if you're in the sky. There's no rescue team there anymore once you went off, okay? And don't forget, we are here to help you uh, by organizing these things, ECA with us, uh, but also the industry experiences here. Uh, use this, okay? Use this not only now, but also during your submissions, okay? Because we all want, if you go for such a business decision, we know that you did it carefully, so therefore we want to be it a success. So use all exchange moments that are available. Thank you very much. Thanks, Hugo.